we are all a guarantor for one another. We're all part of the same body. We're all one nishama. We're one soul. We're going to give a quick introduction just to get everybody up to speed with where we're holding. We're now holding right at the middle of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit. And to give a quick recap of what happened in last week's parasha, last week, unfortunately, the parasha starts off with Sarai Menu passing away. Sarai Menu, the ripe age of 127, passes away, and Abraham is busy finding a place for her to be buried, and he does so. The next thing on Abraham's to-do list was to get Yitzhak married. Okay, we all know the story. Gets Eliezer, sends Eliezer to find Rivka, marries Rivka, Great, bring her back, marries, marries Rivka, very nice. Rivka was three years old and um, Yitzhak was 40 years old. The Torah tells us in this week that finally when Yitzhak and Rivka have a child, he was 60 years old and she was 23. <coughs> they waited 20 years to have children. Many of us, unfortunately, know or know of people who have to unfortunately wait long to conceive something very hard and we're talking our patriarchs and matriarchs we find this rep re repetition by Abraham and Isaac and his wife and also Yaakov and Rachel we're not going to get into that concept we got into that last night after that let's now fast forward from the onset of the conception of Yaakov and Esav in their mother's stomach was a great mystery. Every time she would pass by a house of idol worship, the stomach would be kicking as if to get out. Every time it passed a synagogue, a Bet Midrash, kicking to get out. And she was bothered. What type of child is this? Until finally she went and she found out and she was told that she has twins and she was okay with that. One with this, with this source of a soul and another with a different source. That was fine. The kids are born. They were different looking, as we know. Yaakov was less hairy, fine skin, regular hair color. Esav was hairy. Esav was red hair. He was a little more wild. However, as the commentaries and specifically Rashi on our parasha tells us, until the age of 13, no one was able to tell which one was going to be the greater of the two. Right? All children act silly while they're still young. But only once they were 13 did they start developing to the personalities that they were actually going to become. And then, in no longer than two years, Esav has become, unfortunately to say, a very wicked individual. And to this, God looks at Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to spare you from the suffering. Although you should live till 180 years old, just like your son Isaac lived, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to take five years away from you. So you do not need to see your grandchildren, or at least one, your grandchild, commit so much horrible things. And this was the day that Abraham passed away. The same day Yaakov was preparing for his father, Yitzhak, a lentil soup, which is traditionally what many of the tradition to eat when it's Seudat Havara, it's the meal, the first meal after the burial. And Yaakov was preparing that first meal for his father, Yitzhak, because now Yitzhak was sitting mourning, he was sitting in Shiva. Comes Esav, the Torah tells us, and Esav is tired, Esav is hungry, and he comes and he tells his brother, feed me. I need to eat. I will die. Yaakov says, I can't. He says, give it to me, please. He starts pleading to his twin brother. So Yaakov says, okay. He was a businessman. He says, give me the rights of the Bechora, the birthright. Give me the special uh, additions uh, that, that a Bechor, a firstborn has. Give me that right and I'll give you the food. And Esav in his distress did so. The Mi'am Loez, one of the very famous uh, Midrashim, tells us that Esav did five horrible things on that day. And four of them proceeded. The fifth one was that he disgraced the Bechorah, the birthright. 
However, the first four is what brought him to be tired. And the Ma'am Loaz teaches us that sin makes a person tired. A person that devotes themselves towards chesed, a person that devotes themselves towards tzedakah, towards tefillah, towards Torah, of course you become tired. I'm not going to say you could stay up for 24 hours, but it doesn't wear a person's body down. When a person is involved in doing mitzvot and, and the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it does not take as much of a toll on the body as chas v'shalom, one who's involved in vanity and lo alenu even in sin. The first was that, sorry to mention it this way, but he had marital relations with a woman which was not permitted to him. The terminology was a nara meurasa, meaning it was a woman who was engaged and designated for a certain other individual, and he went forth and committed a horrible sin with her. That was the first. The second was he murdered. That day, he's 15 years old. He murdered somebody. Does anyone know who he murdered? Very good, very good. Nimrod. Nimrod now has to be at least 200 years old. Now again, 200 years old doesn't mean frail back then, as we know. He was a king. He was a very prominent and special individual. Not a nice, not a great person, but still a 15 year old killed him. What's the story behind killing him? Very good. There was a coat. Nimrod was, had the prized possession of Adam Harishon's coat. And Adam eventually gave it over to Noah. Noah gave it to his son, a coat. Noah gave it to his son, Ham. And Ham was the grandfather of Nimrod. So Nimrod inherited this fine coat, which was, uh, which was originally Adam's, which was attested to give major powers to whoever wore it. And so this was every hunter's as, as what, as what uh, he was. Esav, he was a hunter. It gave him major powers to be strong and do as he wishes. And he killed Nimrod to get the coat. So that was the second thing he did wrong. The third was he denied the existence of God. Uh, 15 years old. Your grandfather's Abraham, your father's Yitzhak. Imagine. The fourth was he denied the belief in Tehiyata Metim, in the resurrection. And then the fifth was he disgraced the Bechorah, the birthright. All these five things made him tired. All these five things sealed him to be a complete Rasha. And then what happens? HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away Avraham right before all of this happens. The day that Avraham dies is the day that he committed all of these. God spared Abraham from seeing that suffering and seeing that degeneration and that wickedness in his own grandchild, which was very, very special. 48 years later, I'm, getting, I'm finally getting to the Zerashim Shon, I'm just giving us an introduction. 48 years later, Ronen, how old are they? 48 plus 15. Is? 63. Very good. If I would have put a dollar sign and, and, and six zeros after, it would have been quicker. <laughs> <laughs> they are 63 years old. Vayhi Hayom, it's the day that finally Itzhak says, Esav, I want to bless you. Today is the day I want to bless you. So on this, the Zerem Shim Shon asks multiple questions and gets into the whole concept of Yitzhak Avinu losing his eyesight. So before what we see in the English version, I went back to the original Hebrew version, and he gives us a, a, a deeper prelude to the main uh, yesod, the main fundamental lesson that he gives us. He starts off with a Midrash. The Midrash tells us that Isaac beseeched God, he requests God to suffer in this world. You say, why would he want to suffer? Why would anybody want to suffer? He goes to God and he tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I want to suffer in this world because at the time of my passing, I don't want all of my judgment, all of my deen to be laid out in front of me. The analogy I would like to explain is imagine you have a court case. In the court case, they open up the file and they examine each and every document opposed to keeping the file closed, looking at your overall life, and saying, okay, you're a pretty honest individual, you're a good guy, you're, you're, a, great, you're a great person, 
okay, you're not perfect, but keep it closed and, and move on to the next world. So he requested from God to suffer in this world, to take, so, so this way he had merit from that eventual uh, very stringent uh, din and judgment. To that, the Zerah Shimshon says, that was the Midrash. The Zerah Shimshon says, one second. Are you telling me that Itzhak was the first person to sin? We have already 20 generations. Itzhak is the 21st father to son being born. He's the 21st generation in our Torah. You're telling me no one suffered before him? That's what the Zerah Shimshon asks. He asked to suffer? Meaning he is he's, he's, uh, being the innovator. He's innovating the whole concept of suffering. What does that mean? So he says as follows. He says that really, as a group, there were groups of people who suffered. For example, the flood. Many people suffered. For example, Tower of Babel. Many people suffered as well. Many people died. Sedom. Many people died. But as a group, people would suffer. As an individual, no individual would suffer. And he goes on to explain that the reason why they suffered as a group, not because they deserved it per se individually, rather collectively, they needed to be shooken up to turn back to God. But as an individual, the way it used to be, is there was no suffering in this world. It was towards the exit of their lives that they would have that deen all spread out, that judgment spread out in front of them. And then they would go to Olam Abba and enjoy Olam Abba. So he was the first, the Zerah Shimshon is proving to us, he was the first individual to ask and receive suffering. Now we get to the main question. This is what we find in this week's parasha. Very good. So when, 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 I, when, I, when I learned this, I thought about that. Adam Arishon's own curse was that he's going to work and it's going to be hard work. Okay? There's a difference between hard work and physical suffering. Okay? But still, there's a difference between hard work and physical uh, ailment and suffering. There's a difference between going to work and, as we're soon going to see, losing your eyesight or getting sick. Okay? So he was the first. That's for men or also for women? Men and women. Because women was uh, Who? Uh, caused by uh, Chava to have pain in, in... Very nice, very nice. And, and that's uh, individual. Very nice. So that's so then the answer is no, that's not individual. That's half the population. Well, but it's individual women. Right, but also when, when, when Sidom when Sidom burnt down, and when people drowned, it's not each one is drowning by themselves. Well, they are. But it's looked at collectively. We're talking as an individual receiving their own Yisurin, their own suffering. Isaac was the first. So now let's move on to this week's Pasuk. Let's take the Zerah Shimshon's word for granted on that point. Although we can definitely debate it some more. I, 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 I accept. We, if anyone has the book inside, they can follow. It says, Vayhi ki zaken Itzhak. Itzhak is getting old. Okay, Ronen. If the boys are 63, how old is Itzhak? 123. Okay? Itzhak is 123. Itzhak is getting older. And his eyes were starting to dim on him. He was losing his eyesight. He takes his firstborn, his elder, he takes him over Esav. And he tells him, now I'm going to bless you. Isaac tells him, I'm getting old. I'm old. I don't know when I'm going to die. He goes and he tells him, go make me a meal. And bring me back. Bring me back some, some catching. Go get, go get an animal and make it for me the way I like it. Make me matamim. So this way I can bless you. So this way I can bless you before I die. The Zerah Shimshon asks now a, a series of amazing questions, and we will not will will narrow down to three main questions. The first is why is Itzhak assuming 
that the fact that he is losing his eyesight, that he's gonna die now. What does that have to do with anything? Lavdil, until I was 24 years old, I never had to wear glasses. All of a sudden, 24, my eyes started getting a little not as good. Some of us that happens at a younger age, some of us happens at an older age. That's fine. But why is Yitzhak now assuming, the Zer Shimshon asks, that because his eyesight is diminishing and it's dimming, that he's going to die soon? That's question number one. Question number two, what does the fact that his eyes are dimming have to do with him blessing his son now? Okay, so your eyes are dimming, blessing your son, what does that have to do with anything? And the third question, why does he say, now I have aged? Again, let's read it. Vayomer, hine nazakanti, now I got old. So those are the three questions, just as a quick recap. The first question, why is Isaac making a correlation between the dimming of his eyes and his death, which is coming, the arrival of his death? The second is, okay, fine, dimming of your eyes, what does that have to do with blessing your son, Isaac? And the third is, why is he saying, now I'm getting old? Yesterday you weren't old, you're 122, you're 123, is there a difference? We know he's going to live till 180. What, what, he's getting old now? So listen to the way the Zerah Shimshon asks. He says, there's another Midrash. There's a Midrash which discusses what was the reason why Isaac's eyes were dimming. Uh, here he brings down four opinions, but there's really a fifth. The first opinion is because Isaac used to flatter Esav. We all know that Hanifa, flattery, is one of the four types of people that God detests. There's a difference between complimenting somebody and flattering them. Complimenting somebody is thanking them and appreciating or praising them for what they have done and giving them the proper respect and honor for that. But if you go more than that, if you go above and beyond, Kadosh Baruch Hu hates that. And the main reason why is because it's not genuine anymore. It's not honest. You're doing it because you want something back. So that's the first reason, that Isaac was punished and his eyes were dimming because he flattered his son Esav, number one. Number two, the Midrash says, or it could be that he raised a wicked son from his main wife, unlike, unlike uh, Abraham. Abraham's main wife was Sarah and his main son was Yitzhak. But Yitzhak had one wife and the two children should have been equal. So as a punishment for raising a wicked son and not bringing him back and doing everything he could, although we know he did, but at the end of the day, the results were that he wasn't as righteous and pious as we would expect. He was punished to have his eyes dimmed. Next reason is because at the time of the Akedah, when he was at the Mount uh, Haramoriah, he looked at the Shekhinah, he looked at Hashem. So to say, the, the sky opened in order for an angel to come down and tell Abraham, hey, stop, don't do this. And he looked, he peeked through and he saw Hashem. He peeked through, he saw Hashem, that affected his eyes. Or the angels were crying. This is the fourth, uh, fourth uh, opinion. The angels were crying and the tears of the angels crying because they were going to lose Yitzhak went into Isaac's eyes and he became blind because of that. And the fifth opinion is because of the smoke of the Akedah actually uh, damaged his eyes. This is a Midrash that Zerah Shimshon brings. So now he says, now we're going to tie it in, we're going to answer the question. He says, Itzhak, what did he do? He asked God, preceding his death, to give him suffering. Now, all of a sudden, at the age of 123, he sees his eyes are starting to fail on him. He says, ah, the onset of my request to God is coming. I asked to suffer before I die. Suffering's coming now. That's why he thinks he's dying now. That's the answer, num question number one. Why is he making a relation between the dimming of the eyes and dying? Oh, because that's what he asked for. He asked for right before his death to save him from that, that open judgment of each and every extrapolating every single case. So that's why he put the two together. So now why bless Yitzhak? Well, first of all, every father before they pass away, they feel like they need to impart their father, mother. They need to impart their, their children and their grandchildren with a blessing. But why Esav specifically? Look at how genius the Zerah Shimshon, what he says is. He says, if it would be 
because of Isaac that my eyes are dimming. Sorry, if it would be because of Esav that my eyes are dimming. Well, why is it happening now? It should have happened when he was either born, when he started being bad. Why right now, when he was 15? Not when he's 63, 15 he already became a murderer, an adulterer, an idolatrist. He did uh, all horrible things. A robber. So back 48 years ago, he should have started losing his eyesight. Ah, he didn't lose his eyesight back then. It's not because of Esav. It's not because he's wicked and it's not because he flattered him. It has nothing to do with Esav that his eyes are dimming. So therefore he felt that the blessing still belonged to Esav. That's genius. It's absolute genius. And to answer the third question of why is he saying he's aged now? Well, we answered that already. Because now he's aging, he's coming close to his death because the suffering is actually coming. Now, a lesson that I took out from this uh, amazing Hidush is that how do we look at suffering? When we suffer in our lives, when we have challenges, when we have pain, do we look at it as an annoyance or do we look at it as... Well, obviously an opportunity for growth, but I want to say more. Do we, look at it as, at it, as, do we look at it as if God is sending us a message? Isaac took that second approach. He took the approach, this must be a message from God, proving to me that A, he accepted my request to have my suffering towards the end of my life. B, my son Esav, is all deserving of that blessing because the dimming of my eyes was not related time-wise at all with Esav's misbehavior. So what did he do is he, he looked at the suffering that was going on in his life and he says, this is a gift from God. This is a sign from God. God is talking to me. And in each and every one of our lives, we come to places we come to scenarios, phases in our lives where we suffer. Could be physically, could be emotionally, could be our, our livelihood is suffering. It does, there's, there's always a case in our life that we could be suffering. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us those clear messages and it's up to us to decide are we going to take it as an annoyance? Are we going to discount those messages? Or are we going to focus in and pay attention on them? And that's what Yitzhak did. Yitzhak was reading the events that was going on in his life and he was putting it together and he was making a calculation based on what's happening. This, uh, these are the conclusions that he was drawing. And that is the first of the two uh, Dvar Torah that we're going to mention tonight from Zer Shem Shon. The next one, happens later on. So finally, they're the age 63. Isaac tells Esav, go and prepare me this meal. Who's listening? We all know. Rivka. Rivka is there by the door and she listens to the Yitzhak telling Esav what to do. Esav goes, goes on the hunt and she quickly tells Yaakov, 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 come, come. Quick, take the two goats we have, slaughter them, I'll help you prepare them, put on a costume, and you're going in to get the blessings. And not asking any questions, he's just going along with mommy's plan. Mommy's plan never fails, right? <laughs> and so it was. He comes in to meet his father Yitzhak, and Yitzhak says the following, Vayomer Yitzhak el beno. He says to who he thinks Esav, but it's really Yaakov. Mazot miharta limtso bini. Wow, you did that fast. How did you do that so fast? Vayomer. So what does Yaakov, aka Esav, answer? Ki hikra Hashem elokecha lefanai. God, your master, elokecha arranged it for me to happen really quick. The Zed Shimshon says, wow, really? Why is he saying Elokecha? 
It should say Elokeinu. So either word. Either don't say anything, just say Hashem. Or say Elokeinu. But Elokecha? Your God? Okay. So let's... That's the, that's the basic answer. Let's get a little... The Zer Shimshon obviously knew that answer. We all know that answer. He got it a little deeper. I want to give a, a very brief introduction to the terminology which is most bothering, or maybe second to most bothering in this Pasuk, which is Hikra. Ronen, what does Mikre mean? No. Mikra is a chance. It's a fluke. It's more attributed to Mazal. Luck. Okay? How do we say in Hebrew, providence, divine providence? Hashkacha. So, the terminology that Yaakov used of Hikra by chance was also very, very interesting terminology. The truth is he's not the first one in our Torah that uses it. Last week someone used it. Does anyone know who used it? Could someone help me? Last parasha. Last parasha. Eliezer. Eliezer turns to God before, like right on his, on his exit when he leaves. He says as follows. Hakrina lefanai hayom. He says, arrange it. But using the terminology of mikre. He doesn't say, tashgiach or hashgiach li. Hashgiach na lefanai hayom. He says the terminology of mikre. Of by chance. Hashem, make it and I'll arrange it quickly for me today. What's he saying by chance? There's no luck. Hello, you're the Eved. You're the prime slave and the greatest, greatest student of Abraham. You believe in chance? There's no chance. There's no fluke. So Rabbi Pincus explains, and I'm just using this as introduction so we understand nicer the Zerah Shimshon. Rabbi Pincus explains a beautiful concept. He says... The way we think of chance is not really what chance means. There's two things. We'll say in Hebrew, there's mikre and hashkacha. There's chance and there's providence. Okay? The way we think of chance is a mistake. It happened to be. You happened to be there. You know, you, you were driving and someone drove into you. Chas v'shalom. Banged your car up. Bad luck. Was that bad luck or not? definitely bad luck but was that God's will or not he explains it as follows hashkacha sorry mikre is like when a leaf falls off a tree and finds itself resting itself right over here here and not here and not here right over here that leaf fell here that was the will of God as ridiculous or unimportant we think it is but that was the will of God and more than that it all carried itself out through nature Teva what's Hashkacha? Hashkacha is when a Kadosh Baruch Hu looks down at someone or something and he makes a Gzardin he decrees this for this person will happen for the good or for the bad but what happens how does it carry out? it carries out from going from God to a Malach and to another malach, and sometimes to even more and more and more, until the malachim carry it out. The angels carry out that very divine decree, that gzira. That is hashkacha, that's providence, divine providence. Mikre is God himself who makes it happen without the intermediate, or help, so to say, of an angel. And therefore, when Eliezer goes and he tells Hashem, Hashem, arrange it quickly, using the terminology of Mikre and not Hashkacha, he said, wow, God has to be involved in this trip. A trip that should take me many, many days took me a day. Today is a very special day. Hashem is directly with me. It's not even with Malachim. Hashem, make it happen quickly. Directly, not with the Malachim. And what's the difference? Why so quickly? We see the same by Ruth. Ruth HaMoavia, who does she eventually have a child with, which is eventually the, the, the patriarch of, of David HaMelech? Boaz. The Pasuk says as follows by, by Ruth. Vaikar mikre helkata sadele Boaz. She happened to have been 
by chance, Mikre, we all speak Hebrew. She happened to by chance be by the field of Boaz, found his tent, and then they were together, and then they had David's ancestor, David Amelech's ancestor. Why by chance? That's providence. Ruth and Boaz. That's providence. No. It's Mikre. Not as a chance the way we think of it. As, oh, it was by mistake. It was only God involved in that, in that special episode and not Malachim. Now we ask why? Because if the Malachim catch wind of it, the Satan can also catch wind of it. And then the Satan, whenever he knows something is so pure and so holy, will do anything and everything to stop it. The Satan only goes after the most important parts. As we say, what is the greatest part of our whole Shabbat morning service? Opening of the Ark. Pitichat Ha'ichal. The Satan will let us be quiet Shema, be quiet Amida, no problem. When does everyone need to speak? Pitichat Ha'ichal. Because he goes for the best. He goes for the most valuable, right? Imagine I put you in a room with many valuable jewels and I tell you, take one thing. You're gonna go for the biggest or the most expensive item. Satan's the same way. So how does, how does HaKadosh Baruch Hu act in very special situations? He doesn't let neither the Malachim, neither the Satan get wind of what's going on in order so that they can't sabotage the divine plan. No, no, Zemikre. Oh, it's, it's, it's mikre. This is this is this is this is disguised. Chazak, mikol Hashem, very nice. This is disguised under the terminology of chance and mazal, but it's direct with God. So now let's go back to our pasuk. Our pasuk. Why is he using the terminology of by chance? And furthermore. Why does he say your God? Either no, either just God, doesn't have to say your God, or say our God. What is he saying? Elokecha, your master. Zerashim Shon asks. He says as follows Yaakov was answering to his father and telling him, God made a miracle for me. Right? Hikra, Hashem made the miracle. Hashem made the miracle for Eliezer, made the miracle for, for Ruth. He made me a miracle too. But again, he's, he's disguised as Esav, right? He was getting very advanced in the terminology he was using. He said, mistake, mistake. There's no such thing as mistake. Mistake is only, is only uh, God's will, divine and, and, and only will, not, not with Malachim. And therefore, he was explaining to him, don't worry, Abba. Even though it's a miracle, you're still allowed to eat from this meal. The Talmud tells us righteous people, or not only righteous people, anybody, should not look forward to partake from a miracle. Don't take part in a miracle. Meaning, if a miracle goes on, we should not be looking to benefit from it. That's not what we were created for. We were created to, as, as, as Ralph said, Work hard for what we get, deserve what we work for. Don't look for miracles, don't look to benefit from miracles, the Talmud tells us. Benefit. How? Any miracle that happens, it's a you benefit. If you're looking to, you can, you can decide not to benefit. The Red Sea? Well, again, there's obviously certain questions. In general, yes, of course, that's a good example. What? Everyone's going through the, the splitting sea and you're not gonna go through. In certain situations, there's definitely cases where we need to benefit from miracles. But a miracle such as, maybe we can say like this, a miracle such as this, which is unimportant, so to say, not to benefit. You could wait another half an hour, another hour to have a regular meal. So what was Itzhak bothered with? Itzhak was bothered with maybe Esav stole this from somebody. That's how come it came so fast? So what's Yaakov answering? No, no, I didn't steal it. It was a miracle. What? A miracle? I can't take part of a miracle. No, 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 you could. Why? That's why I said Elokecha. Elokecha, as the Zerah Shimshon explains is, God already placed His name upon you. 
God only places his name upon the deceased. Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzhak, Eloke Yaakov, they all passed away. When Abraham passed away, it was Eloke Abraham. Yitzhak, before he passed away, already was referred to the God of Isaac. How and when? Well, when, when Yaakov was traveling with the, with the ladder, and the, uh, the dream of the ladder and the Malachim, already in the dream it was referred to, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. But, but Abba's still alive. So uh, Yaakov was coming and telling Yitzhak, you have no reason to be worried to partake in a miracle because even though taking part in a miracle in this world can take away a, from your merit in the next world, you already have your next world prepared for you perfectly because God has already considered you dead, not in a bad way, but dead in the fact that you fulfilled your mission on this world and your olam haba is per perfect and prepared for you. So partake in this, in, this mir in, in this miracle. It's very, very deep. I hope everyone's following, but it, it's, 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 it's extremely deep, the concept. So again, I just repeat it very quickly. Why is he using the, the, the terminology of a mistake? It's not a mistake, it's really a miracle. And why, not, why does that have to say, Elokecha, your God? Because your God already put His name on you in your life. So you could partake in the miracle in your life. Now, the Zerah Shimshon brings a very strong Musar, a very strong lesson from this. And with this we'll end, and we'll end off with a story tied into it. It's fascinating. The Zerah Shimshon says, we see that anything that happens in a person's life, happens because it's the will of God. Anything that happens, more than that, we have to attribute our successes to Hashem. After all, what can we accomplish? How many years are we here for? How smart are we? How much can we go without eating? How much can we go without sleeping? We're human beings. We're completely physical. We, we, we're, we're tied down to this world. We're very limited, each and every one of us. As great as we are, and talented as we are, we are all very limited physically. How do we tap into being more successful? By understanding that God is running the show and God is the key to our success. And that by us understanding that and being grateful to Him, attributing to Him our success, then he feels like doing more for us and he helps us do more. Yaakov could have told him, Hey, it happened quick. What could he have said in his mind? <laughs> it wasn't God that made this happen. It was mommy and me, Rivka and Yaakov. We're the ones who made it happen. She heard, we quickly worked together, quicker than Esav. We made it happen. No, 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 no. What did they say? It was a miracle. A miracle from God alluding to the concept that we have to understand that everything that happens to us in our lives happens because it's God's will and He wants it for us. And we have to just be grateful and understand and know where it's coming from. And this is something which promotes humility, promotes humility to, to any and everybody, which is a beautiful concept. It's uh, tying back to what we spoke about this morning. And I'll end off with a story. Um, Years ago, there was a certain individual who contacted the, the rabbi, Rabbi Israel, who is now modern, in modern times, he's promoting the Zerah Shimshon with all his might, everything that he can do. And he called him and he said, wow, the, there was a certain Dvar Torah, this one specifically, this Dvar Torah of attributing all of our success to God, and, and, and recognizing that, which really, really inspired him. And he went and he told it to a very famous rabbi. His name is Rabbi, I'll pronounce it properly, Rabbi Elimelech Bitterman, which is a very famous rabbi in Yerushalayim, in Eretz Yisrael, who, whose divret Torah go out to a minimum of 8,000 people weekly. And this was back then. Wait till the story, the story is amazing. He told him this divret Torah not, not so long ago, within the past decade, let's just say. Before the internet. 
Mm, no, no, during, even during, decade, decade, the last past 10 years there was definitely the internet. Obviously not 8,000 people in one room, we're talking uh, tapes, CDs, ri uh, writings, emails, okay? He told him his Divrei Torah in the name of the Zerah Shimshon, and he went on that week to say it in the Zerah Shimshon's name, which in effect, now 8,000 people learnt an amazing teaching from this very special and holy author. Very nice. Exactly one year later on the same parasha, that man who told the big rabbi that Divrei Torah had a baby. But the baby this time, the birth and the labor was very different than the previous ones. The previous ones, the, the mother, his wife, gave birth always very late. Very painful, long, stretched out labors, very, very suffering. This time, she gave birth on time and very quick. They got into the hospital, they got to the room, boom, it happened. So the individual was thinking to himself, wow, his name was Abraham. He's thinking to himself, wow, what's the coincidence that the same week, exactly a year later, that he helped promote the Zera Shimshon's Divrei Torah to be spread to at least 8,000 people, and Hashem paid him back, Rav Nachmani paid him back, to have a baby in a miraculous way with the least amount of suffering for his wife. So I'm reading this story, honestly, midnight last night, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, these guys are stretching it. Honestly, I'll, tell, I'll share my honest, honest opinion. I look at my phone and I receive an email. Now, normally we don't receive so many emails at midnight, right? I receive an email at that moment. As soon as I pick up my phone, a minute or two before I receive the email. Well, guess what email that was? Better. Torah Wellsprings, which is Rabbi Elimelech Bitterman. At the moment I'm reading a story where I'm doubting, is it for real? Is it not for real? Comes to us. Now, as all we, we all know, weekly emails, they don't come at the same time every week. Whether it's newsletters, divrei Torah, business greetings, they never come out exactly the same. It's when it's ready and when it's actually sent and when it gets to your inbox. What are the chances of that exact moment that I'm reading a story about this rabbi that I'm, I'm honestly, I was doubting, how could that such a far-fetched -fetch, connection? And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, don't doubt, it's for real, it's really for real. And I'll end off with, with a story which, which I, I've witnessed firsthand. There's, an, there's a member of our community who their wife has hyperemesis. Hyperemesis is a, is a condition which is quite rare yet often enough that when a woman becomes pregnant, she is extremely, extremely nauseous and nonstop vomiting and very sick. It happens between to one to two percent of women. It's rare, but it, that's still, that means every hundred women, there's either one or two that has it. And his wife for the first pregnancy was sick from day one till the last day. Around a month ago, I started learning with him Zerah Shimshon on a weekly basis. He bought the book, he started reading it regularly. Three days after he bought the book and started learning from it, his wife comes over to him and says, he, sorry, he goes over and says, how do you feel? And he didn't even tell her that he bought the book and the Sigula. He, didn't, he wanted to really test it. He goes over, how do you feel? She says, I feel great. You feel great. I remember last pregnancy, the whole nine months. I remember last week, you told me you feel horrible. What's all of a sudden you feel great? She's like, don't bother me, I feel good. What, what's wrong, you don't want me to feel good? And then he told her that he bought this book, he started learning it weekly, and that he's hoping that, that the connection, it seems like a quite obvious connection, was because of the author and the author's promise. And I'll end off with what's the greatest promise the author gives us. It's this, it's a, I have more stories. There's, there's plenty, plenty. There's stories that the book brings down, and there's stories firsthand of people that I know. I'm still waiting for my miracle, but it's fine. <laughs> but listen to this. That's not a miracle. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. So listen to this. Listen to this. Chazak. Um, Knew what did I want to say? <laughs> I forgot. 
Anyways, yeah. Bezat Hashem, Akadosh Baruch Hu. The you, what? You were, you were talking about the, the story that say the book of it. Oh, very good. Yes, the greatest Chazak. Thank you. I appreciate it. The greatest uh, blessing that the author Zecher Tzadik Livracha gives, and I told this to a few of you already, is that one who regularly studies, regularly studies from the Sefer, will be blessed for their own children to learn Torah forevermore. Their children, their grandchildren, their descendants. Amen. There's nothing greater than that. As we said, prayer is very important. But if one prays and does not learn Torah, they won't know how to pray. They won't know how to look for God in their life. We understand as Jews what makes us the greatest in the fact that we're the most connected to God is the fact that we learn Torah. Many of us in Baruch Hashem here in Hollywood, daily, sometimes more than once a day, many hours a day, we're so lucky and fortunate to have that. To others, Weekly, twice a week, three times a week, it doesn't matter. Whatever a person is able to do, they tap into the divine wisdom even greater and even greater. And in the merit of this sefer, one who learns from this sefer, I can't promise it to you, but this rabbi was able to. This rabbi was able to promise it.